Okay, so the, the boot's on the other foot now. I, he's the boss. I'm keeping the time. So I'm going to rush through and make sure I get through on time and get lots of good feedback. Um, so um, you've heard from Claire Anne this morning about the building blocks of immunity and from Andy about how we can measure uh, immunity to vaccines, uh, usually by measuring antibodies in blood. Um, and my job really is to tell you why mucosal immunity is important. And we don't really, uh, not very good at understanding or measuring mucosal immunity, but it is something you, you should know about. And the aim of this talk is to give you an explanation of why that's important. <clears throat> now, uh, tinyurl.com forward slash AFIN hoop is a TED talk, um, which you could, it's about pertussis vaccine, but it covers some of the principles that I cover in this talk. So you might want to take a look at that at some point. You make a note of that. Um, and then uh, the bottom is my Twitter handle. I tweet about vaccines if you're a Twitter person, although I have to say it's become such a hostile environment. I'm not doing it much anymore. But, uh, yeah, if you're a Twitter person, that's my handle. Um, so that's the right button. So I've added the word well to this opening slide. How do vaccines really work? It's probably not fair to say that they only work through mucosal immunity, but to get a really good vaccine, you need, I'm going to argue at least, that you need um, uh, a good mucosal immune response, at least if it's against an infection that's passed from one person to another. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, a lot of the time you need a mucosal immune response if you're going to have an impact on transmission with other population level. So indirect effects or herd immunity. And the best vaccines we have are all ones that can do that. <clears throat> um, now, this is not new. This is a, um, a, a newspaper piece quoting John Bell from Oxford a, a year ago, saying how important it would be that the COVID vaccines could interrupt transmission, which they actually don't do or virtually don't do at all. Um, and actually, here's a piece in the New York Times that was written by me and Rick Malley as early as August 2020, saying that we should be thinking about this. And I'll come back to the COVID vaccines at the very end of the talk, just as to give you an example that there is a ray of hope that we may be able to find ways of immunizing against COVID that do interrupt transmission, because although the vaccines that we've got are very good at preventing you from getting seriously ill, they really don't do very much when it comes to transmission. So uh, this is the, this is the, <laughs> this is the one slide that I use in just about every talk I do on vaccines. And this is the summary of how vaccines work. And most of the time when we're talking about vaccines, we talk about specific or on-target effects. So measles vaccine to prevent measles. Uh, and most of the time, most of the world, most of you, most parents, most doctors think about specific on-target direct effects. That is to say, you immunize your child with vaccine against disease X so that your child doesn't get disease X. You give him or her measles vaccine so that she or he doesn't get measles. But the indirect effects also really matter. And the indirect effects relate to the fact that you give your child a vaccine and then he or she doesn't then pass that infection on to the next child or to someone else in the family, the prevention of onward transmission. So these are still specific on-target effects, but they're operating at the population level. Um, now, we're not really going to talk about off-target effects of today, except in this talk, except to mention that they exist. Uh, and from my way of thinking, there are two parts to this. There's downstream effects, so you prevent someone from getting flu, and as a result of it, they don't get die of secondary bacterial pneumonia. That's a downstream effect. They didn't die of pneumococcal disease because they didn't get flu. And there may also be lateral effects. The best example of that is probably giving BCG to young infants, and they may well not die of other infectious diseases <clears throat> than TB, because of effects of the vaccine on their innate immune response. But for today, we're talking about these indirect on-target effects and where mucosal immunity comes in. Now, think for a moment about this, because there are actually quite a lot of people who can benefit from indirect effects. There are lots of different kinds of people who haven't been vaccinated. They may just not yet have had the vaccine in the program. They may not be the right age or in an eligible group. They maybe just don't want it, they, they don't like vaccines, or they may not remember or get around or have a bus fare to go and get it, or they may not be able to pay for it in certain circumstances, um, and they may actually be vulnerable in some way that means that they can't actually safely receive a vaccine. But that isn't 
just the list, the whole list, because there are also people who have had the vaccine and either didn't get an immune response that protected them or their immunity has worn off. And again, COVID is a good example. These are vaccines that don't work for very long. So these are primary and secondary vaccine failures who may also benefit from indirect effects. So just remember that there are a lot of people out there who can benefit in this way. Actually, mucosal immunity is not the only way in which you can interrupt transmission with a vaccine. The most obvious and and perhaps well understood uh, mechanism is if you have sterilizing immunity. If you've got a really good vaccine so that somebody who receives it is never going to get that infection, then they clearly will never pass that infection on to anyone else. And measles is a reasonably good example of this. It's a very good vaccine. Certainly, if you've had two doses, you're not going to get measles and you're not going to infect anyone else. But a lot of vaccines are not that good and don't provide that kind of level of immunity, at least not all the time, to everybody. Um, And if in that situation you may get a weakened uh, infection, a milder infection, and the vaccine may essentially render you less infectious. There are other examples. If you've got a disease that isn't from one person to another but via a vector, you can imagine vaccines that may interrupt that stage of the life cycle. And then on the right-hand side, you've got a a diagram of ring vaccination, which, of course, was the mechanism that was ultimately used to eradicate smallpox. That's immunizing around a case, and it's more recently been used in the case of Ebola. So there are ways to interrupt transmission with vaccines. But the one that we're talking about today is mucosal immunity. Now, why do vaccinologists need to know about mucosal immunity? Well, I've been arguing up until now that this is a a very important mechanism whereby vaccines work at the population level. Anyone want to suggest to me a vaccine that we routinely give to children, which absolutely does not work this way? Against a disease that is not passed from person to person. Shout it out. Tetanus. All right, tetanus. You can immunize everybody in this room apart from you, and you'll still go out and get tetanus if you stick a fork in your foot because you're not getting it from anyone else. But most of the vaccines we use are from from one person to another. And we usually only find out about these herd effects, these indirect effects, once we implement a vaccine and begin to see a disappearance of disease in people who actually haven't been immunized. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, So why is it so little understood mucosal immunology? I mean, I don't know how many people in this room would put their hands up to say, They've got their head around mucosal immunology and it's something they've sorted. There's probably not very many of you and I probably wouldn't put my hand up and I've been doing it for decades. It's a very difficult subject to understand. You might need these mucosal immune responses for your vaccine to work, but you don't need them to get a license. Um, Norman didn't uh, emphasize this yesterday, but what you need when you want to get a license for your vaccine is a good portfolio of safety data in the people receiving the vaccine and some kind of evidence that the vaccine will work, either clinical efficacy endpoint or at least a surrogate of the kind that Andy was telling you about earlier. That's all. You don't need to have anything else about what it will do when you actually implement it. That comes later. So there's not that much incentive to spend a lot of money on studying this kind of phenomenon because you actually need to if you're just going to produce a vaccine and get it licensed. But the other reason is that, you know, we've been trying and trying, but it's very difficult to establish good correlates in the way that Andy was describing the difficulties with serum. But how much the more if you're talking about saliva or uh, samples from the gut? Very difficult to measure reliably an immunological measure that will tell you how well that vaccine will interrupt transmission. This slide uh, just summarizes a a paradigm which is widely misunderstood, (coughs) but worth thinking about. So generally speaking, people will assume that if you give an injected vaccine, you get systemic immunity. You get B, maybe T cell immunity with lymphocytes in your blood that you can measure. And people often think that on the yellow, a mucosal vaccine is going to be very good at inducing mucosal immunity. And broadly, that's true. Most of these vaccines are live attenuated vaccines that cause mucosal infection. But those small arrows are valid too, at least some of the time. Uh, Some injected vaccines do induce mucosal immunity. I'm going to give you some examples of that just now. Uh, And mucosal vaccines can also induce systemic immunity and measurable antibodies in the blood. So these two compartments are not entirely separate. I guess the B cell was the center of what you've heard for the first half of the day. 
And the B cell is the cell that us vaccinology immunologists mostly study. And we mostly measure IgG responses in blood, either functional or binding antibodies. Uh, and you're going to be hearing a lot more this afternoon about immunological memory, memory B cells, and, and our ability to recall and produce larger, faster immune responses. This talk is about this umbrella, which is often forgotten about. And in the context of a vaccine program, often the, the inadequacies of the immune responses that we can induce with these vaccines are kind of covered up for by the, the population level effects on transmission. And they kind of protect us against the vulnerabilities that we have in our, in our vaccine programs. So now I'm going to spend a few moments just telling you uh, some examples of really potent mucosal immune response induced indirect effects. Um, many people predicted that rotavirus vaccines, when they eventually got introduced in the first decade of the century, would not induce indirect effects because they were only going to be being given to very young children and there was lots of rotavirus around in the rest of the population. But they did. And I just want you to see these are data from Dan Payne and the CDC group in the States. If you look at the green bars, these are children who are two years old. In 2006, there was no rotavirus vaccine being used in the States. In 2007, it was introduced. In 2008, the disease in two-year-olds disappeared. How many of the two-year-olds at that point had had rotavirus vaccine? Well, it's on the bottom right-hand corner, 1.1%. So the disease had gone away in an age group who had not been vaccinated. They had been indirectly protected by the immunization of the younger kids. And we saw something very similar in the UK when we introduced the vaccine in September 2013. We saw no rotavirus in the January season in children who were too old to have received the vaccine. Powerful indirect effects. What about uh, human papillomavirus, virus-like particle vaccines? Well, the Australians got going with this. And there was some <clears throat> early observational data looking at uh, not, not at genital, not at cervical cancer, because that takes a while, but genital warts, which is much quicker. And they were using the full valent vaccine with the, with the genital warts 6 and 11 types. Uh, these are observational data. The red line showing what happened in the women who'd received the vaccine, the young, young women, girls, and the blue line in people, same age group, but not receiving the vaccine. And you can see it going down in the red and not going down significantly in the blue. So that's direct protection. You've immunized them. They don't get the, the, the gentle warts. But what happened in the men <clears throat> or the boys? None of them got immunized. And you can see that the boys that had sex with girls were being protected. In other words, the rates of gentle warts were going down. But the boys that had sex with boys, no change. Indirect effect. So it's observational, but very compelling. And then this is the best bit of the slide. Because if you're over the age of 26 and you're a male, you become sexually invisible to young women because you're too unimaginably old and uninterested. And so you don't get protected by them being immunized, only if you're under 26. <clears throat> uh, meningococcus group C, so this is a conjugate vaccine against bacteria. It's a polysaccharide protein conjugate introduced at the turn of the century in the UK. And you can see direct effect on the black line because there was a catch-up program all the way to 20 years, and that disease went away. But the green line are people over the age of 20. So we're seeing a disappearance of meningococcus group C as a result of mucosal immune responses to an injected vaccine that is eliminating circulation of meningococcus group C. And we're seeing disappearance in the rest of the population. And this story gets quite interesting, because at the time, we really thought in terms of these vaccines working by their direct effects. So we gave three doses to infants because we wanted to protect them directly at the time of highest risk. And then as the penny gradually dropped about how these vaccines really work, we took a dose, gave it to the one-year-olds. We took another dose, gave it to the teenagers. And eventually we stopped immunizing infants altogether. We don't bother with direct protection of infants against men C in the UK because we can protect them indirectly by immunizing the teenagers. And when the next strain of meningococcus came through, at the end of the first decade of this century, meningococcus group W from Latin America, you can see each of these groups of bars, the successive years in different age groups, going up steadily between 2009 and 2015, right the way across the population. What we did was we just immunized the teenagers. And now there's clear published evidence showing 
that that strategy works and we've seen a disappearance of men W, both disease and carriage, as a result of indirect protection. So this is a vaccine strategy program that is predicated entirely on its indirect effects. All right, because if you just protect, if you just immunize the teenagers and you didn't have any impact on the younger children, you really wouldn't be dealing with the problem. What about flu? Well, you heard quite a lot about flu yesterday from Roy. And one of the most important things he told you was that it's a, it's a borderline infection. It's not that infectious. The R0 is quite low. You haven't got to do that much with flu to really break the, the, the transmission chain. And so, in a way, it's a very good candidate for indirect effects. Now, young children are more infectious with flu than older children and adults. They, they more often get flu, but they have pre preceding immunity. They excrete the virus at higher titers for longer periods. These are not real data, but this illustrates the point. And it leads to this phenomenon of grandparenticide. <clears throat> okay, so this little girl is giving her grandfather, and I'm feeling nervous now because I'm a grandfather, a Christmas kiss. And with it, she's giving him the influenza A strain she picked up at nursery last week. And as a bonus prize, the serotype 3 pneumococcus that she also picked up, which will in fact cause the secondary bacterial pneumonia, which will kill him in the first week of January, just as he's beginning to recover from the flu. All right, so this is transmission at work. These are observational 20 years ago. Japan at the top panel, uh, United States at the bottom. The black lines are excess respiratory mortality, so essentially flu deaths in the elderly, and the wiggly version showing the seasonality and the, the smooth version in the middle. And the grey bars are the doses of influenza vaccine being distributed. And you can see a U-shaped curve in Japan, which relates to the use of the influenza vaccine. What you don't see is a similar trend in the United States at the bottom with increasing numbers of doses at the last decade of the 20th century, but no real, very clear impact on excess respiratory mortality in the elderly. What's the difference? The difference is who was getting the flu vaccine. In the top part of the slide in Japan, it was school children. And in the bottom part of the slide in the US at that point, it was nearly all elderly people. So if you want to stop old people dying of flu, one way to do it is to give flu vaccine to children. Um, this is much better quality evidence, prospective randomized control trial done in Canada in small rural communities called Hutterites. Each pizza represents a community, and the colored dots, red, are children being immunized with flu vaccine, yellow in control communities being immunized with hepatitis A, which we don't think does much to flu. <clears throat> what this trial showed was that you could protect the adults, the white dots, against pcr proven flu by giving flu vaccine to the children. This is an inactivated injected flu vaccine. So you can interrupt transmission of flu within a population uh, by indirect effects. And in the UK, we decided to introduce the nasal flu vaccine, which is a, a live attenuated, at this point, trivalent vaccine uh, given intranasally. And we started in 2012 in the youngest preschool children and started a pilot program looking at schools. In the red areas, they were the, these were areas where primary school kids were given the vaccine, and in the green areas, secondary school kids. This is the same kind of data as I showed you from Japan. The red line is excess respiratory mortality, i.e. flu deaths in the elderly. And you can see that there's a clear reduction in the areas where the primary school children were given flu vaccine. So this is, again, observational data that suggested that you can have a powerful indirect effect using the, inact the, uh, the attenuated nasal flu vaccine. Now, uh, we need to spend a bit of time actually telling you some immunology rather than epidemiology, since that's meant to be the talk. And this analogy <clears throat> is a, a way of sort of seeing the difference between systemic immunity that you learned about this morning and mucosal immunity. So I would liken what you learned from Clairan as the cruise missile approach. The cruise missile, at least when it's working properly, is got a very clear target and it blows it up. It's a seek and destroy weapon. Of course, it may, of course, not work and kill a whole lot of children in a primary school now and again. But the idea is that you, you wipe out your enemy in a very targeted way. Mucosal immunity is not like that because it's not working in a sterile or a putatively, hopefully sterile environment. 
Mucosal immunity is like this. It's like the Green Party. It's like trying to keep the peace. It's trying to keep equilibrium in a complicated world. <clears throat> and that's what you've got to try and do with your mucosal system if you're inside your gut or your upper respiratory tract, which is heavily colonized with all sorts of different microbes. Uh, and you're not trying to wipe them out, far from it. Actually, there's more uh, immunocytes in your mucosal immune system by a long way than there is in your bone marrow or your spleen or your lymph nodes and those interesting things that you were learning about earlier. And they are distinct as well. They, they're, they're, while they, you still have B cells and T cells and antigen-presenting cells and structures, they are nevertheless distinct in terms of their homing receptors and their function. And the regulation and the balance is affected by the microenvironment, in particular the, the microbes that colonize that area of the mucosae will influence how the, the behavior, if you like, of the mucosal immune system. Here's a, a quick anatomical sketch from an excellent review published in 2014. You can see there, and you can see many of the things that you learned about earlier. This is the small intestine, which is the most well-developed immunologically of your uh, your gut organs. And you can see the epithelial cells. You can see intraepithelial lymphocytes, a pious patch, which is very much like a lymph node. You can see mucus being produced. You can see an M cell, which is essentially a, a sensory cell, an antigen presenting cell. Uh, on the right, you can see some dimeric IgA, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a minute. The black dots are antibacterial peptides. And then down at the bottom, you can see all those familiar things, the T cells, the macrophages, the antigen presenting cells, uh, all feeding into this. So you've got all the pieces of uh, a functioning immune system there. If you go to the large intestine, it's a little bit simpler, but nevertheless, you've still got IgA being produced, you've got these peptides being produced, and you've got these same kinds of cells. I don't want you to get too bogged down with these kind of immunological diagrams. They tend to make your eyes glaze over because there are too many arrows and abbreviations on them. But the point of this slide is to say that the, the bacterial colonizers of your gut are the drivers of your mucosal immune system. And there are profound differences that will occur according to what's there. For example, if you breed an animal and keep its gut sterile, its mucosal immune system simply doesn't exist. It doesn't even evolve. It doesn't happen, which is quite different, of course, from the rest of the immune system. Uh, and what this is showing you is that there are drivers towards a more inflammatory on the left-hand side at the bottom or a more anti-inflammatory pattern according to the different microbes that colonize your gut and the quantity of those microbes at any one time. So this gives you a sense of the balance of what's going on. This slide is just to illustrate the fact that there is antibody-independent immunity going on in the gut. What you're seeing here is something called a T helper 17 cell or TH17 cell producing IL-17 and other cytokines. And it's doing several different things. It's interacting with antigen-presenting cells, with neutrophils, and also these red dots here are these antibacterial peptides. So there's a whole branch of immunity that we're in the process of studying and understanding that goes on independently of antibodies, but has not yet yielded a measure that we can use when we're trying to understand how well a vaccine works to prevent transmission. And IgA, which is an isotype of immunoglobulin, is the one thing that we are able to measure and are beginning to make some progress with. It's... Uh, vastly present in all mucosal secretions, very large concentrations of IgA. <clears throat> there's a lot more IgA in you than there is IgG, even though there's a lot more knowledge about IgG in most of your heads than there is about IgA. <clears throat> the more microbes there are, the more B cells producing IgA there will be. And interestingly, unlike in inability to produce IgG, which is more or less a death sentence in childhood, if you can't produce IgG, you die of infections before very long in childhood, you can have very low levels of IgA and still get along quite well. Not to say that you're completely well, you're more prone to autoimmune problems, both gastrointestinal and respiratory infections, but it's not the kind of hole below the water line that not making IgG is. This is what the IgG molecule looks like. It's in humans, it's dimeric, some animals it's more monomeric. So two molecules of that Y shape that you're familiar with with the usual building parts of immunoglobulin joined together with a J chain. And then there's this thing called secretory piece. What's secretory piece? It's part of something called the polymeric IgA receptor. And this is important because it's a mechanism by which 
we actively transport IgA from the basal side of our epithelium into the mucosal secretions. And it looks like this. So the IgA is produced by B cells in local lymphoid tissue or in the, in the, in uh, remote sites like the spleen and bone marrow. And then it's picked up by the basal side of the cell by this receptor and then actively transported across the cell. And then it's released into the lumen with this piece of the receptor attached. So you can, you can recognize secretory IgA, which has been actively transported by the presence of that secretory piece. And I'm just going to finish up now by showing you a little bit about IgA and come back to the story of SARS-CoV-2. So we published these, this paper actually just last week, and it's looking at the IgA response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And you're, what you're seeing here is uh, using an ELISA is a secretory IgA in saliva of people who've had PCR proven SARS-CoV-2 infection in yellow. And then we've got a collection of pre-pandemic saliva samples that we'd kept from uh, people of similar age and demographics uh, beforehand. And that, that's an IgA response to the infection. You make an IgA response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. These data, which we've not yet published, show what happens in your saliva when you have repeated doses of mRNA vaccine. And the answer is nothing. You don't make an IgA response to this vaccine. And we've looked at other vaccines. We've got studies with the Valneva vaccine, which we were closely involved in developing. It's a very good vaccine, unfortunately not being used, but it doesn't induce an IgA response. So we, these vaccines that we've got at the moment against SARS-CoV-2 don't produce a mucosal immune response and don't effectively block transmission. <clears throat> this is a picture on the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, this is a picture on the left of an adenovirus, about which you've heard a lot in the context of SARS-CoV-2, but I'm telling you a different story here. This icosahedral uh, particle of an adenovirus uh, has got these pentons on the corners, on the vertices, and in between it's got hexons, which are the dark blue bits. And if you manufacture a penton, um, and ignore the fibers, which are non-covalently bound, and put them in a test tube, they self-assemble into an icosahedral particle just of the pentons, which we call the adoma. And this actually gives us a vast particle which we can engineer to create vaccines, the custom-made vaccines, if you like, because you can put epitopes from a virus or a bacterium onto the vertices of this icosahedral particle by putting them into the sequence into it in the baclovirus system where you synthesize the protein. And then this is a final data slide where we've made a COVID-19 vaccine with the adoma and given it to mice. And what you're seeing on the left-hand side are nasal uh, secretions, and then on the, on the right-hand side, bronchial alveolar lavage in these mice. And the, the red bars that you see where there's a response, a secretory IgA response to spike, are where you've given this vaccine intranasally to the mice. So this is a non-live engineered vaccine that induces mucosal immune responses. Now, this is mice. Who knows whether this will work in humans, but it creates the possibility of creating a vaccine that might interrupt transmission of this and other viruses. So this is the end of my talk. I hope you have got the following messages. You almost certainly need um, indirect effects if you're going to control spread of an infection within a population of the vaccine. Unless your vaccine reliably induces sterilizing immunity, you'll need the mucosal immune responses to get indirect effects. And most vaccines don't induce reliable sterilizing immunity. There are now examples of vaccine implementation strategies designed primarily around their indirect effects. And the example I gave you was uh, conjugated uh, multivalent meningococcal vaccines for teenagers. The best candidate we have so far for a mucosal immune correlate of protection of uh, uh, protection against transmission is secretory IgA. And there is the possibility of designing mucosal vaccines aimed primarily at inducing mucosal immunity and indirect effects. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Adam. Um, questions? Okay, start here. Um. When you talk, um, Tan Yui from Thailand, um, when you talk about indirect effects prevention of onward transmission, is it the same as herd immunity? And uh, another, uh, is it mechanism, is it by reduced colonization or reduced shedding that make an indirect effect? How, how it's worked? 
Okay, I mean, I think the first part, broadly, yes, uh, so, but I think indirect effects describes more accurately what we're talking about than herd immunity, um, which is a slightly vaguer term, but essentially it's the same phenomenon. In terms of mechanism, uh, putatively at least, it can have could have two different effects. It could have an effect on the afferent loop of the infection, in other words, make the infection make it more difficult for the infection to become established or to become a, 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 a wide, widely distributed infection, but also it could interfere with the onward transmission phase. You remember hearing from Roy yesterday that the, the two key things in an epidemic curve are the R0 and then the generation time. So you, you could be having an influence on either the beginning or the end or even the middle of that process in as much as the infection is going on at the mucosal surface. All right. So most infections from person to person are essentially going on from one mucosal surface to another. There are various mucosal surfaces, some of which we talk about more happily than others. But nevertheless, we rub our uh, mucosae together or we create droplets and we transfer from one mucosal surface to another. <clears throat> Question in the front here. Yeah, you, you can go ahead. Hi, Anna from the Netherlands. Uh, would it be possible maybe to, to give an IM vaccine, but also administer something uh, intranasally like uh, the chemokine or an adjuvant to, to, to uh, improve the mucosal immunity? Yeah, I, sorry, there, 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 there are a number of different ways you could aim to do this. I think the obvious way that most mucosal immunologists I know think you should go about creating mucosal immune responses is by delivering the vaccine to the mucosal surface. You all just had really nice lunch. All right. But I don't think you're busy making mucosal immune responses to the lunch right now, even though there's lots of foreign material in it. So actually generating an immune, a mucosal immune response is something you need to really work quite hard to achieve. Um, and of course, if you start putting in pro-inflammatory adjuvant materials, you run the risk of causing side effects. And there was a good example of that with a non-live adjuvanted flu vaccine, which caused facial nerve palsy, for example. So it's not a straightforward challenge. And the way that that's been solved mostly is by giving attenuated mucosal infections like the flu vaccine I told you about or polio vaccine rotavirus. But in principle, it's possible. And of course, you're right that you, that as I showed you in the yellow and blue slide, the systemic compartment and the mucosal compartment are not completely separate. They're connected. So you may be able to induce immunological memory and then stimulate a memory response in one or other of the two compartments, yeah. <clears throat> Some more question around, yes. Hi, I'm Hanska. Um, I was interested in your intranasal data. I was wondering how important do you think it is to use an intranasal device to control a kind of droplets spray, or can you just use drops in the nose for, for intranasal administration? Uh, that's an interesting question. The... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know the answer. I, it may just be my ignorance, but certainly that is the only way in which that nasal flu vaccine has been used. It's a very simple device, actually. If you've not seen it, it's like a little syringe. Uh, and instead of having a needle on it, it's just got a little hole and it creates a spray. Um, but in principle, yes, it could, I think, perhaps be administered in different ways. Um, but you've just got to get enough of the of the vaccine in to establish the infection into what is very commonly a very snotty-nosed child, and snottiness being the normal condition of preschool children. <clears throat> One more in the front that we... Yeah, I just had a question on the last slide in the in the future of the COVID-19 vaccines, right? Like, yeah. That's moving towards uh, preventing transmission. Is yeah. that like a specific product, and is it determined based on the platform if it's an mRNA or... What's a protein base? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, declaration of interest. Right, Adoma is a, um, it's a there's a spin out company called Emoferon, which is spin out from the University of Bristol. I don't own any IP or shares, but I do consult for them. It's a preclinical program, so at this point, it's not been in humans. There's been animal studies with the chikungunya vaccine and with this uh, this uh, COVID vaccine, but it's it's now moving towards a clinical development program. OK, so it's preclinical at this point, um, but it's a protein vaccine. It's not a there's no nucleic acid. It's not a vector. It's not mRNA. It's just a good old fashioned protein vaccine. The closest you would get to it would be something like hepatitis A or the HPV vaccines, which are also virus like particles. <clears throat> OK, yes. 
Hi, I'm Catherine. Um, I was interested in your discussion of the microbiome and how it relates to mucosal immunity. Are there globally regional differences in the way microbiomes are are populated, and does that change transmission dynamics from vaccination in different areas? And is that something that could be altered or affected? Uh, yeah, anyway? this is a hot area, I would say. So there, there's a rich literature on microbiome and, and immune responses. Um, things like differences between children who've been breastfed and bottle fed, uh, different demographics, different populations. Uh, we've seen some very dramatic differences in the efficacy of rotavirus vaccines in different parts of the world, uh, which uh, may well be related to the microbiomes in those different populations. Um, so the, it, it almost certainly is an area in which there's the potential to modulate how well vaccines would work. However, there's also a lot of false claims being made of people wanting to you know, sell you a product that's going to make your health better, which are not necessarily uh, evidence-based. Um, and then you get onto the whole area, some really quite good data on, on uh, modifying the microbiome to prevent infectious diseases in a more broad way. So it's a hot area, and I think it's something that we will be learning more about, but there are no simple answers to it just yet. <clears throat> yes. Maya from Gabby. Um... So I was just wondering, you said that it's it's difficult to know whether there will be indirect effects of vaccines. So how do you then set your vaccination strategy and choose what age? Yeah, that's a lovely question. I'm really glad you asked me that because that's 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 kind of what I'm most interested in. At the moment, we develop these vaccines. As I explained, you don't need to know any of this stuff to get a license. And then we kind of introduce the vaccine and see what happens. And half the time we do it wrong because we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and we do need to find ways of understanding or predicting what indirect effects will be like, either by doing some kind of pilot study at a population level rather than an individual level, or by having some kind of immunological measure that would help us predict what's going to happen. So, I mean, I didn't know in August 2020 whether the COVID-19 vaccines were going to impact on transmission or not. All I was doing was saying, this is something we ought to be trying to find out rather than just waiting and then finding out later. Um, and, and we found out much, I was predicting, contrary to my veterinary colleague, who's a much better mucosal immunologist than me, that they would, and they would induce mucosal immune responses, just like the meningococcal and pneumococcal vaccines had that I'd studied in the previous decades, and they didn't. So, it, yeah, the answer is we need to sort this out, because at the moment, we don't know what's coming down the track. And it's really important. <clears throat> One question at the back, yeah. I know, Andrew. Do you have an idea about kind of immunity or secretory IgA responses there in these vaccines? Yeah, thanks. That may be one of the good examples of how to go, go forward. Yeah, absolutely. So the there, I think there are sort of three or four different vaccines in use. Uh, uh, including vaccines in China and, and other parts of Asia. But um, the amount of information we have is very limited, actually, on that side of things. In principle, my expectation is that you would see uh, mucosal immune responses, but I've not seen good data either way. Maybe you can tell me more. Yeah, so the, I, I have seen the, uh, the Indian mucosal vaccine, nasal vaccine, and the secretory IgA response seems to be, it is a vectored uh, vaccine using the same Chadox uh, adenovirus vector. And uh, the secretory IgA response seems to be good, but unfortunately, <laughs> there is no opportunity to use that. Uh, this is available now for a heterologous booster, but uh, we do not really know uh, in terms of uh, human use and uh, impact on transmission or yeah. establishment of yeah. infection. I, I think thinking about it now, the uh, colleagues in Oxford have also done a study of mucosal administration of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that Andy was very involved with and didn't see much in the way of the mucosal response. Is that right, Andy? Uh, I wasn't very involved in that study, but you're, you're right. I, the point yeah. I was going to make was that uh, in the, the trials that, uh, in fact, uh, you and I did together on the COVID vaccine in the UK, um, we did show that there was a big reduction in transmission 
Um, and that, but that was only with the original virus that, that once the new variants emerged that that stopped. So I think we just have to be slightly cautious about yeah. saying there's no impact on mucosal immunity <clears throat> with COVID vaccines because there clearly was. It's just yeah. that it's not sustained because the virus mutates to escape from that immunity. Yeah, no, thank you, Andy. And that's true. And we certainly see IgG responses in the mucosa, in the saliva uh, of vaccine recipients. So it's quite wrong to say that there's no impact on transmission. I think the main shortcoming of the current vaccines is the transience of that level of protection against relatively mild infection. It's uh, quite short-lived and therefore you don't get an enduring effect on population transmission dynamics. Two last questions, one here and we have the last one. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. My name is Esther. I want to find out about the rotavirus, the indirect effects in the older children, because programmatically speaking, we usually give rotavirus in the first year of life. Uh, because the peak incidence is that age group. So the indirect effects, is it actually because of less risk in the children who are three, four, five years of age? Or is it actually as a result of the, the younger children that you immunized? How are you able to differentiate that this is because of the vaccine that you gave at a younger age of, age of life in the younger children? Are you talking about the flu? No, rotavirus. Oh, rotavirus, rotavirus. Yeah, I, I think uh, we were all very surprised actually with the at the level of indirect protection from rotavirus because you don't really imagine that the virus is being much spread about by infants. Um, you think of it more as toddlers, you know, when they're, uh, <laughs> they're running around and in contact with each other more. Um, but it, it, I, I, think, I, I think the way I would choose to explain this it really comes from what you were being taught by Roy yesterday about epidemiological waves. Uh, th th there are multiple moving parts to an epidemic. So it relates to the infections of the virus, the infectious load, the behavior of the people, the contact between the people, the generation time, all of those things mixed together to make an infectious agent either highly infectious, so you get a very big uh, epidemic, maybe as you do in a pandemic when there's an absence of immunity, uh, to something that's much more borderline. Um, and, and you may not need to move things very far in certain circumstances to make a profound difference. You know, if things are really on the edge of being able to have an R value that's greater than one. And that must be the case with rotavirus. So you, you only really need to immunize the, these babies and you'll see rotavirus circulation disappear. There's just not enough of it going on outside that early age group to sustain an epidemic. Okay, last question. Yeah, hi, Ulrike from the US. Um, so in those pathogens that are somehow transmitted via a respiratory pathway and somehow nasal carriage either transient or you know more uh, consistent at what point is there kind of a concern that there could also be a negative trade-off when you eliminate certain pathogens and i mean obviously the most you know well-known example is pneumococcus right so you don't completely sterilize the nose you just get something else somebody else in Right. So where is the sweet spot there and where should we land? Mm -hmm. No, it's a really good point. And you you can equally well argue that um, the extraordinary capacity of conjugate protein polysaccharide vaccines to interfere with the carriage and the, the, the ecology of the nasopharynx is a bad thing, as it is that you can argue that it's a good thing because it's opening you up to unknown avenues, if you like. But you can also argue the other way and say this is a massive added value. You know, we really don't want to have meningococcus. We don't care if it's not there. Right? <laughs> we don't want children dying of meningococcus. Goodbye, the meningococcus. We're okay with that. So you can you can argue it either way, but you you do have to acknowledge what you're saying, which is that you will you will modulate the ecology of your nasopharynx by doing this. Uh, and of course, replacement serotype replacement is an example of that with pneumococcus. Yes. <clears throat> or you could also think with COVID vaccines, right? Then the one strain, you stop transmission, but then in the nose, there could be other strains that are kind of more you know, taking place. And then yeah, I mean, with COVID, we were in a very bad place in 2020 because no one in the world had any relevant or protective immunity. We're now in a really good place, you know, uh, because we've all got some degree of immunity. Some of us are going to die of COVID, but most of us are not going to die of COVID. And so we can relax. But I think when you're talking about the microbiomic environment of your gut or your upper respiratory tract, you want to change that in a profound way with some degree of caution. Yeah.